In this video, I'll attempt to expand my vapor compression refrigerator into a two-stage system using the ethylene I made in my last video as a refrigerant for a second stage with the goal of reaching minus 100 C. To recap from my last two videos, a multi-stage refrigerator is basically two refrigeration cycles where the cold end of the first stage cools the warm end of the second stage. The term warm here is relative, and in the case of my second stage refers to a temperature of around minus 40 C. Using ethylene as a second stage refrigerant, condensation should occur at around 15 bar, and if the flow resistance is tuned correctly, the evaporator should allow the ethylene to expand to around 1 atmosphere, which should bring it down to a temperature of minus 104 C. Now it is technically possible to get lower temperatures by using the first stage refrigerant in both stages, but it requires the second evaporator to run far below atmospheric pressure and become sort of impractical. Broadly speaking, for most compressors to operate with a reasonable degree of efficiency, if your evaporator is running at one atmosphere, you want to be able to condense your refrigerant at no more than, say, 15 or 20 atmospheres. For a room temperature condenser, propane is ideal, and for a condenser running at minus 40 C, ethylene fits the bill. Other options could be ethane or carbon dioxide, but ethane is more complicated to produce and carbon dioxide will freeze in the evaporator and clog it. The second stage of the refrigerator is built pretty much the same as the first, but with the addition of one key component, the oil separator. At the lower temperatures involved, the compressor oil will freeze, which will cause the system to clog and the compressor to eventually pump all its oil out, overheat, and die from lack of lubrication. The oil separator causes the ultra-fine droplets of oil in the loop to coalesce into large drops that drip down to a collection sump in the bottom, which is then forced back into the inlet side of the compressor from the high side pressure. This is usually done through an extremely thin capillary tube or solenoid valve that periodically opens because the rate of oil circulation is very tiny. Another component of the second stage is the aftercooler. This isn't strictly required, but makes the process more efficient because the second stage refrigerant will still be heated from compression even if it doesn't condense into a liquid at room temperature, and removing that heat takes a bit of load off the intercooler. Okay, let's get to the build. A lot of people in the comments on my last video pointed out that a real refrigeration system is brazed rather than soldered, so I got a more powerful torch and tried my hand at a few brazing joints. They don't look pretty, but let's see if they hold pressure. Easy way to test this is just to hook it up to a fridge compressor with a flare fitting and dunk the joint in water. This compressor tops out around 500 psi. If there's any leak, we'll definitely see it bubbling at that pressure. I didn't see any bubbles though, so I guess my technique is working, even if it's not that pretty. That was a phosphor copper alloy for brazing copper to copper or copper to brass, but the oil separator I got has stainless steel tubing coming off it for some reason, so to braze that to copper I'll need SSF 56, which is a silver solder with some sort of fluorine based flux. Just FYI, if you're going to use this, the flux fumes will make you horrendously sick, so make sure you do this outside and wear a respirator and eye protection because that stuff is nasty. The end result is a pretty nice clean joint between the copper and stainless, and I didn't see any bubbles when I pressurized the separator and submerged it in my bathroom sink. After that, I braced the separator to the outlet side of the aftercooler coil, which had previously been the evaporator coil for the window AC unit I took apart in my vapor compression video. To make the connections for pressure gauges, I braze a 1mm inner diameter copper tube to a 1 quarter inch MPT cap with a hole drilled in it. Copper to brass doesn't require the silver solder, but it does require some flux to stick right. I put clear silicon caulk on threads before tightening down any fittings, but going forward I should really use some of that gooey thread sealant paste stuff. For this particular build, the second stage will need yet another component, which is a buffer tank. The buffer tank helps to ensure my high side pressure can be as high as possible for a given pressure ratio by adding additional volume to the low pressure side of the refrigerant loop. If I didn't have the buffer tank, what might happen is the compressor could pull the low pressure side down to well below atmospheric pressure, which would drastically reduce the maximum pressure possible on the high side. In this case, it's much more important that I have a large high side pressure to ensure condensation occurs. For the second stage compressor, I used the fridge compressor that I had initially used in my vapor compression video. The outlet tube was steel, so I used the silver solder again to join it to the copper tubing from the aftercooler. For oil return, I simply connected a needle valve on a capillary tube to the oil drain line on the separator and crushed the larger tubing tight around the capillary. This would probably only have to be opened for a few seconds once per run. The crushed tubing was then sealed up with solder. Downstream of the oil separator is the filter dryer which will then connect to the intercooler. Turns out this setup is incorrect, which I'll get to later. The intercooler is a plate heat exchanger which is basically just a series of closely stacked plates that have very good thermal contact but the two sides are sealed against each other. 
To connect it to the system, I'll use these 3 quarter inch caps which will have 1 quarter inch flare fittings brazed onto them. Holes are drilled and flare fittings are inserted, then I start brazing. There's a pretty interesting range of colors going on here. I made 4 of these fittings, then slapped them onto the intercooler with some thread sealant. I had to use my big wrench to get a good grip on them. And here's the result. The brace joints are a little ugly, but ended up working pretty good. Doing a submerged leak test with my air compressor doesn't reveal any bubbles. On the other side of the filter dryer, I've got a flared quarter inch line with a flare nut on it to attach to the system. The nice thing about the flares is that if something goes wrong or needs to be changed, it makes it relatively easy to remove and reinstall the intercooler. Next I built the capillary tube assembly. This connects to the outlet of the intercooler with a pressure gauge, 25 feet of 1mm capillary tubing and a needle valve to bypass the capillary for fine tuning the flow rate. In retrospect, I really should have used a smaller diameter tube so that I wouldn't need so much of it. Doing a quick test with the compressor inlet open to the air, I get about 70 psi on the high pressure side with the adjustment valve open. With the valve closed, I get close to 180. Not bad, but I need to go a little higher, so I added on an additional 25 feet of capillary tubing, making the total length 50 feet. Definitely need a smaller diameter. It also makes the whole assembly a bit messy. With the additional capillary length, the pressure tops out at around 220 psi when open to the air. With 1.5 to 2 atmospheres of inlet pressure, it should produce more than enough pressure to condense the ethylene when it hits the intercooler. Next, I move the buffer tank into position and hook it up with more flare fittings. Here's the evaporator coil. It connects to the capillary outlet on one end and has a T to connect to the buffer and the compressor inlet on the other end. I had a minor hiccup with leaks though, and after starting out with a static charge around 55 psi, a few hours later I was down to less than 40. Putting my gauge underwater for a pressure test revealed that there was a slow leak through the fittings that I needed to correct. I fixed the leak, but then realized I had to rearrange some things. First off, the filter dryer is supposed to be on the liquid side of the condenser, which in the case of the second stage meant putting it on the intercooler outlet. Also, the intercooler is supposed to be vertical. This way, liquid refrigerant from the first stage can enter through the bottom and evaporate upward, while gaseous refrigerant from the second stage can enter through the top and the condensed droplets can fall downward. Gravity is your friend in this case. The intercooler also needs to be insulated very well. This component isn't rejecting or absorbing heat from the environment. It's transferring heat from the second stage to the first stage refrigerant. Any heat transfer to or from the environment would result in losses. Here's a look at the whole system after rigging it up for the first stage. Things are a little messy, so I've highlighted the components to clarify what's going on. We have the first stage compressor, first stage condenser, first stage capillary tube, the intercooler, which is the first stage evaporator. At the bottom, you can see that the inlet line is iced up and the first stage return line. Moving to the second stage, we have the compressor, the aftercooler, the oil separator, which is the crimson cylinder hiding behind the high pressure gauge. Again, the intercooler, which is the condenser for the second stage. The inlet is on top and the outlet is on the bottom. The filter dryer, the capillary tube with the adjustment valve, the low pressure side gauge, the buffer tank, the evaporator, which is inside this foam box that the thermometer is sitting on, and the return line. Here's a closer look at the intercooler in action. The first stage inlet and second stage outlet are iced up while the first stage outlet and second stage inlet pipes are basically room temperature. I'm running this first test with propane in both stages just to verify that everything works. Once everything checks out, I'll switch the second stage to ethylene. As you can see, the condenser pressure is running at a mere 90 psi compared to the first stage's 200 and the evaporator is sub-atmospheric. In this case, with propane, I bottomed out at minus 56 C. A good bit colder than the single stage unit, but not as cold as it could be with ethylene as the refrigerant. Once I had confirmation that everything was working, I pulled out the ethylene storage tank and hooked it up to my second stage fill port. The initial charge used about half my collected ethylene, meaning it consumed about 42 liters STP. That seemed a little surprising to me, but I guess the intercooler added a lot of volume to the system. The initial charge got me 320 psi on the high side, running 25 psi on the low side. No real cooling was occurring yet though, maybe it needed more ethylene, so I drained my tank down to 30 psi from the original 120. The high side was now 350 psi with the low side around 12. Still nothing was really happening. I drained my tank down to about 20 psi which brought my high side beyond the scale of the pressure gauge at least 420 or so psi with the low side as high as 45. At this point I was seeing some cooling but the temperature never went below the evaporator temperature of the first stage 
meaning the temperature I was seeing on the evaporator of the second stage was probably just cold gas that had been chilled by the intercooler but not condensed. This really left me scratching my head. The second stage gas was being cooled to about minus 32 C. At this temperature, the ethylene never should have gone beyond about 18 bar, which is 250 PSI, but I was well past 400. Maybe the problem was that I wasn't getting good heat transfer. That seemed unlikely since these plate heat exchangers are supposedly extremely efficient, but I needed to get to the bottom of this, so I replaced the plate heat exchanger with my original coaxial coil that I built in the first vapor compression video. I ran the same test with propane in the second stage, this time reaching as low as 75 psi in the condenser instead of the earlier 90, which suggested that my coaxial coil was getting the second stage refrigerant colder than the plate stack was. Anyway, it seemed to be working, so I loaded my ethylene back in and tried again. Once again, I went well over 400 psi on the high side, and things were definitely getting cold, but not any colder than the first stage evaporator, which again implied that all I was doing was cycling cold gas without any phase change. So the problem probably isn't the heat exchanger. There's actually two issues here. For one, the average temperature of the refrigerant on the high pressure side is much higher than the temperature where it comes out of the heat exchanger. For example, in this case, the intercooler outlet temperature was minus 32 C, but the propane pressure was 75 PSI or 6.1 bar. But 6.1 bar corresponds to a temperature of 8.5 C, not minus 32 C. Similarly, in the first stage, the condenser outlet temperature is basically ambient at about 24 C, but the pressure is around 200 PSI or 14.6 bar, which corresponds to a temperature of about 43 C, not 24 C. I think the cause of this is that the pressure needed for condensation is a function of the average temperature throughout the high side. The inlet temperature of the first stage condenser could be as high as 60 or 70 C, causing the average temperature to be significantly higher than ambient, even if the outlet is ambient. The second problem is that the ethylene I've produced is probably contaminated with hydrogen since I ran my catalyst on the hot side. The condensation and evaporation is based on the partial pressure of the refrigerant, so for example, if only 50% of the mixture was ethylene, the partial pressure would be divided by 2. In this case, if you were at a temperature where the ethylene would condense at 20 bar, the total pressure with a 50% mixture would need to be 40 bar to condense, which obviously isn't practical at all. Before proceeding any further, I need to purify my ethylene and remove any hydrogen gas that's diluting it. To do this, I'd need to liquefy the ethylene and then open it up to the atmosphere. This would cause the hydrogen gas to float away, leaving pure ethylene behind. Of course, some ethylene would be lost to evaporation, but what's left over would be very pure. To ensure I could actually get my ethylene to liquefy, I need to make sure that it was all at the same low temperature. This would require having a system very similar to a cascade refrigerator, except the second stage would be static and open loop. In other words, a refrigerated tank that's pressurized with the second stage refrigerant. The tank would be chilled to about minus 40 C, which should allow me to condense all my stored ethylene at under 15 bar. Since it's probably mixed with hydrogen though, the actual pressure is going to be higher. I didn't want to take apart the cascade system I had just built to do this, so instead I went searching for something pre-built. After venturing deep into the jungle, I was able to catch a wild nocturnal ice maker while it was sleeping. I stripped it down to its guts, leaving just the compressor, condenser, and evaporator. Then I drilled a tiny hole in the evaporator to release the butane refrigerant inside and lit it up. I bet you didn't know your ice maker is loaded with flammable gas. Then I wound my own evaporator coil with 3 16th tubing, which would fit inside a one and a half inch pipe section. The capillary tube is wrapped around the evaporator to get some subcooling effect and drive it down to a lower minimum temperature. The evaporator inlet and outlet will pass through this pipe cap in addition to a fill port and a well for a thermocouple. The pipe cap with a single hole is for the drain line. After some very messy brazing, here's what the evaporator assembly looks like. And here's a look at that same evaporator crammed into the one and a half inch pipe section. The edges of the fittings are soldered up to seal them. I used solder instead of brazing because it would make the fittings a heck of a lot easier to remove in case I had to fix something. No bubbles from the submerged pressure test at 300 psi. So far so good. Additional capillary tubing is wrapped around the evaporator return line to maximize the subcooling effect and boost efficiency. A needle valve is then added to the drain line with a soldered on brass fitting and another valve with a pressure gauge and flare fitting is added to the fill port for the pipe. There's approximately 200 cc of internal volume inside the pipe. And here's the assembly rigged back up to the ice maker system. After spending a good 15 minutes vacuuming out the system, I backfilled it with propane and let it run. After a few minutes, the pipe started icing up. 
The system works, but when I try to add more refrigerant, the motor stalls out after a second. This is kind of expected since the compressor was designed for butane, or R600, which condenses at a very low pressure. To remedy this, I installed a 1 gallon buffer tank on the low pressure side of the system. This added a lot of bulk to what had previously been a very compact assembly, but allowed me to add a significant amount of refrigerant to the system while keeping the static charge pressure low enough that the motor would start up without any problems. I also added a valve to this buffer tank so that I could adjust the amount of refrigerant I admitted to the system for a given run, which allowed me more fine tuning. To further increase efficiency, I enclosed the cold bottle in a foam box which I stuffed with fiberglass wool and closed off. I also replaced the propane refrigerant with MAP gas, which is primarily propylene. The boiling point of propylene is minus 48C compared to propane's minus 42. Not a huge difference, but certainly a noticeable boost. This did bring the condenser pressure from around 150 with the propane to about 190 with the propylene, but the compressor didn't seem to have a problem handling the change. Okay, so here's the whole setup ready to go. I chill down the collection pipe and then start pumping in the ethylene from my beach ball. At minus 38C, the pressure is about 320 psi or almost 25 bar. This is another red flag that suggests the ethylene is impure because at this temperature condensation should occur at about 16 bar or 220 psi. Based on these numbers, I'd estimate that it's only about 70% pure with the remainder being either air or hydrogen. Another thing I realized is that while these little fridge compressors can put out up to 3, 4, or even 500 psi, the flow rate becomes absolutely abysmal past around 200. The fact that it took me close to 4 hours to pump down about 85 liters of the gas suggests that an average flow rate of about 0.35 liters per minute, or 0.012 CFM, is what we're working with. The thermal load on the evaporator was so minuscule that I never even saw it move when I began filling the pipe. This means even if I was successfully condensing ethylene at around 400 psi in my cascade system, I'd be moving such a tiny amount of it that there would be practically zero cooling power in the evaporator. Going forward, the fix to this might be to replace the fridge compressor with a rotary compressor, which has a much higher mass flow rate, especially when the inlet pressure is raised. Anyway, once the beach ball was pumped down, I got my collection bottle and attempted to drain the condensed ethylene. And it did kind of work. The thermocouple showed minus 83C, and you can clearly see how cold this was from the sinking condensation, but unfortunately my flow rate was way too high, and rather than dripping cold liquid into my collector, I mostly just blasted it back out the inlet, and it evaporated in the air. Unlike the dry ice I made in a previous video, there's no frozen chunks that get stuck to the walls in the container, so everything just escapes pretty easily. So yeah, all that hard work basically just got pissed away in a couple of seconds by some bad planning. Kind of a good analogy for life, actually. I think I bit off a little more than I could chew, so this project is definitely going to need a part 2 video where I correct some of my mistakes. It's not a total loss, though. First of all, I did technically achieve cascade refrigeration, even if it was open loop, and only for a few seconds. You can clearly see from the frost and sinking condensation that we had an extremely cold liquid evaporating and not just cold gas being blown out the pipe. I think I also got enough information to verify that my ethylene was indeed impure, causing it to require a higher condensation pressure, meaning the next batch will need to be made with a lower catalyst temperature. My little condenser unit also proved to be very useful, and demonstrated that ice makers are a nice cheap way to create a small vapor compression system. Going forward, I can use this thing for making dry ice, since I should only need around 130 psi to condense CO2 inside my chilled pipe. In the next video, I'll attempt to make ethylene of a higher purity and optimize my second stage a little better to hopefully get a cold side temperature of minus 100 C. Once that can be achieved repeatedly, it won't be much more work before I can start making liquid methane and then liquid nitrogen. Thanks for watching and consider subscribing if you want to follow along with this project.